Change failure rate sounds simple, doesn't it? It is how often your deployments fail. But the rest of the iceberg lies in how exactly you define failure. In this video, I'm going to show you how Sleuth helps you define and measure failure and how it ties failure back to a deployment. Let's start at the beginning. What is a failure? With Sleuth, you, there's really two types of failure. A simple failure that is either true or false, you're unhealthy or you're healthy, or anomaly detection. This is where Sleuth looks at metrics at a number and tries to detect what is normal for you and then what's abnormal in order to mark those abnormal parts as unhealthy. Which one is right for you depends on the project, depends on the team and the company, but these are your options. Let's start first with simple failures. Rollback is one of the easiest to understand and a type of failure that Sleuth will detect automatically. Let's say you deploy SHA-1 and then you deploy SHA-2, but then you deploy SHA-1 again. Sleuth will detect that SHA-2 was rolled back to SHA-1 and it will mark them appropriately. SHA-2 will be considered a failure. SHA-1 will be considered successful. The second type of simple failures is an incident. If you're using an incident management system or have some way to track when you've had an incident, Sleuth can connect into that system and detect when there's an incident and mark that period as unhealthy or specifically in an incident state. With Sleuth, incident detection can come from a number of different types of systems. You might have a specific system which is dedicated toward incident management such as Fire Hydrant. Or you might want to plug Sleuth into PagerDuty, so when alerts get fired in PagerDuty, Sleuth will treat those as incidences. You might also have incidences defined as JIRA issues. So whenever there's a problem, you create a JIRA issue. When it's closed, the incident's over, in which case you can point Sleuth at Shortcut or JIRA or an issue tracker. Finally, you might have incidences that are managed in a system that Sleuth doesn't know about, in which case you can use this custom option to tell Sleuth via webhook when an incident's starting and when it finishes. Then Sleuth is able to track it and calculate the metrics correctly. Finally, as a fallback, Sleuth is able to let you specifically mark a deployment as healthy or unhealthy. By finding the target deployment and overriding its health, you can have full control over what's determined healthy or unhealthy, and this change can not only be made in the UI, but also in the API. Let's talk about anomaly detection. So for teams that either don't have incidents management systems set up and just have health metrics, things like CPU, database, response times, things like that, then anomaly detection might be a really useful way for you to use Sleuth to help you find when you are unhealthy. There's two types of metrics that Sleuth can help you track. One is errors. With an error tracking system, you can point Sleuth at Sentry or Rollbar, Bugsnag, any of these systems that track errors, and Sleuth will then every two minutes read the number of errors in the target project. Then it will throw that into its anomaly detection algorithm to figure out if the currently read value is too high or if it's normal. And if it's too high for a certain period of time, then Sleuth will then mark that period as unhealthy. You can also choose to have Sleuth measure just about any metric. So let's say that you had some metrics in CloudWatch or Datadog, New Relic, SignalFX, any of these type of systems where they were measuring an arbitrary metric. You can have point Sleuth at that metric. It will read it every two minutes, do anomaly detection on it. And again, if it finds unhealthy numbers over a certain period of time, then it'll consider that a failure. If you don't see the system that you use for metrics supported, there's also a custom option where you can use a webhook to send Sleuth values every two minutes. And again, the anomaly detection will be used. Finally, you can point Sleuth at a build that runs. So let's say you have a build that runs smoke test against production every four hours. You can point Sleuth at this build. And when this build is unhealthy, it'll mark the health of the environment as unhealthy and when it goes back to success then it'll mark the environment as successful so you can point this at gitlab jenkins sleuth action or github action circle ci any of these build systems the final point to make here is that the anomaly detection and health in general can be customized so down in your project settings under advanced you'll see a couple options first the change failure boundary so let's say that you decided that an unhealthy century reading is ailing and that's fine, you wanna track that, but you don't want that to change your change failure rate. And so you can make the boundary as unhealthy where change failure rate will then take effect. The other way you can tweak 
the way that sleuth detects change failure rate is the sensitivity. It's the amount of time a deploy must spend in an unhealthy period before the whole deploy is considered a failure. So by default, that's seven minutes. You could change that more or less depending on what you'd like. Finally, for the anomaly detection specifically, you can choose to decide how sensitive you want Sleuth to be. So in normally, it requires a certain number of readings before it determines that that's actually a bad period. But you could make this more sensitive, meaning it's going to just do a couple readings and then it's going to mark it as unhealthy or more coarse where it's less sensitive. It'll have to have a high number of unhealthy readings before it determines that as a failure period, therefore affecting your change failure rate. Finally, there's a question, how does a deploy to be determined to be a failure? And the answer for that is actually pretty simple. It doesn't work in every case, but it should generally do the right thing. So what Sleuth does is it looks for a failure period. Once a failure period has been identified, it looks within the project for the last known deployment. Then that is the deploy that will be marked as a failure. This is a good reason why if you have multiple microservices, you should create various projects for those microservices so that a failure in one can't be attributed to the wrong service. This is notable because impact sources are put on the project. That allows each project to define how it wants to define failure and then have that failure associated with the deploy that's relevant to that project. And that's how Sleuth calculates changed failure rate. If you'd like to see how Sleuth tracks and calculates the other Dora metrics, see the videos over here.